There's a story about Detective Sherlock Holmes and his sidekick, Mr. Watson. Mr. Watson is a highly intelligent man, but, but he often missed the obvious. So Watson and Holmes are on a camping trip. In the middle of the night, Holmes wakes up and nudges his partner Watson and he says, look up, what do you see? He looks up and he goes, I see all kinds of stars. And he goes, well, what do you conclude from that, Mr. Watson? Well, astronomically, I conclude that there's millions of stars in the sky. Astrologically, I can see that Saturn is part of the constellation Leo. Horologically, I deduce it's probably about 315. Meteorologically, I conclude that's probably going to be a good day of weather tomorrow. And theologically, I conclude that God's very powerful and we're very insignificant. Then Watson goes, Mr. Holmes, what do you conclude? He goes, you idiot, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> Sometimes we miss the obvious. What does that have to do with our sermon text from John chapter 10? Well, John chapter 10, we find the Jews missing the obvious. In verse 24, they ask of Jesus, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Remember Jesus in the next verse? I did tell you, but you don't believe. The works I am doing in my Father's name testify about me. Jesus taught in such a way that the people could only come up with one conclusion. This man came from God. Because they said, how, how can he know everything written in the Old Testament without ever being instructed? And not too long before this, Jesus had just helped a young man regain his sight. That coupled with all the other miracles in the Bible, you could only come to one conclusion about all these works of Jesus. He has to be the Christ, the appointed Savior. So why were these Jews missing the obvious? Well, to answer that question, we have to pay attention to some of the little details in this sermon text. Look at verse 22 again. Two little details. One, the feast of dedication. The second one, we're told it was winter. Now why is that important, that it was winter? Well, any good Jew would know that if it's winter, that meant that just two months earlier in fall, they had finished celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. That was one of the big feasts prescribed in the Old Testament. Do you know what they did at that feast? Everyone left their house, and they went out, and they lived in shelters they made of branches from trees for one week. That was to remind them how the Israelites had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. During this feast of the tabernacles, they would give very expensive offerings to the Lord. Bulls and goats and sheep. That was to remind the people that God's gift of the promised land was only a blessing and gift from God's hand. Do you see the spiritual point behind the festival of tabernacles? Only God can free you and me and them from wandering in the wilderness of sin and give us the good gift of forgiveness, peace, and eternal life. Well, guess what? Two months earlier, Jesus attended that Feast of the Tabernacles. And while at that feast, he told them, I'm the one who can give you waters of eternal life. I'm the light in this dark world. I am the Good Shepherd. He was teaching them he is the one to bring people out of the wilderness of their sin and give them peace. He's the Christ. But now it's winter. Winter was the time for the Feast of Dedication. What was that? That wasn't a feast prescribed by God. 
It commemorated something that happened 200 years earlier. 200 years ago from this time, a wicked Greek ruler desecrated the temple. He went into the temple, built an altar to his god Zeus there, and guess what he sacrificed on that altar? Pigs. That caused a riot, and a Jew by the name of Judas Maccabeus rose up and overthrew the Greeks. So the Feast of Dedication was to celebrate that event. And it's interesting to note, they didn't pick the Feast of Tabernacles to confront Jesus and ask if he's the Christ. No, it's the Feast of Dedication. They trap him in Solomon's colonnade, a closed off area of the temple where Jesus couldn't get away. And they said, now you tell us, are you the Christ? And he said, I told you, but you didn't believe. Go back to the question. How could the Jews miss the obvious that Jesus is the Christ? They missed it because they had their own idea of who the Christ should be. Their own agenda. That's why they asked Jesus if he was the Christ on the Feast of Dedication, not the Feast of Tabernacles. They weren't looking for that Feast of Tabernacle Christ, that spiritual Savior that would lead them out of their sin to heaven. They were looking for another Judas Maccabeus. They wanted someone who would overthrow the Roman rulers. That's the kind of Christ they wanted, a Christ that would bring them peace and prosperity, an earthly Christ. That's not what Jesus was. And you know why they were looking for that kind of Christ? Because they had a hearing problem and a listening problem. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. But these Jews had stopped listening to God's voice. They no, were, were no longer hearing God's voice in the Old Testament. That told them clearly what kind of a Christ they should be looking for. They were li listening to the voice of their countrymen and their own sinful nature that wanted some earthly Messiah. So what voices are you and I listening to? A lot of voices out there, right? Voices telling you who you should be or shouldn't be, what you should do or shouldn't do, what you should think or shouldn't think, what you should believe or shouldn't believe. Are you going to listen to the voice of your boyfriend or girlfriend who says, it makes a lot more financial sense to live together before we're married. You're going to listen to the voice of your coworker who says, it's not worth trying to work on your marriage. Just bail and give it up. Are you going to listen to those voices that nobody else can hear, only you can hear? That voice inside of you that tells you while you're young, but you feel worthless because you think nobody accepts you. So maybe it's not worth it. I should just end my life. Or that voice inside of you when you're old and suffering and having to go through a lot of things that says, is this really worth it? Are you going to listen to those voices, parents, that make you worry about your kids and the future and what's going to happen to them? Are you going to listen to those voices in your head that have you worrying about, will I ever be married or can we have kids? Are you going to listen to those voices in your head as you get older that make you worry about what's it going to be like getting older? What's going to happen to me? Who's going to take care of me? Are you going to listen to that voice of guilt in your head that comes back again and again about your sin? Those of you high school seniors, college seniors, when you graduate, high school seniors and you're off to college on your own, are you still going to listen to the voice of your shepherd that your parents had you hear? Or are you going to listen to the voice of everyone else around you? Those of you graduating college, are you going to make a decision on what job to have simply by which one pays the most? Or by which one allows you to keep worshiping at a confessional church so you can hear your shepherd's voice. This year we have seven confirmands. Statistics show that only three of them will remain Christian throughout their life. Whose voice are we listening to? Amongst all those different voices we can listen to, though this is the most important question, isn't it? 
Whose voice can you trust? Whose voice will you stake your marriage on? Your family on? Whose voice will you stake your life on this earth on? Whose voice will you trust for eternal life? There was a man who was part of a tour group touring Israel. At a break in the tour at midday, they were all on top of a hill resting. And down below they could see a water hole where five different shepherds had gathered their flocks to drink. The man was watching this and he was thinking to himself, how are those sheep ever going to follow their shepherd when they want to leave? They're all mixed together. Well, after some time, each of the five shepherds left in a different direction. And then you could hear a unique sound being made from each shepherd. And each shepherd's sheep dutifully followed him. Those sheep knew that their shepherd was good, that he took care of them. And so when they heard his voice, that unique voice, they followed him. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Jesus, your good shepherd, knows you, his sheep. He knows what you need and what you think you need. He knows what worries and scares you. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your strengths. He knows your hurts, whether it's abuse in the past, he knows your joys, whether it's celebrations in the past. That word here used to know, it's unique. There's only two words for know in the Greek, and they're different from each other. This one is a word that means experiential knowing. You know by experience. You see what this is saying? It's saying that your good shepherd has walked every step in life you have has seen everything you have had to go through. He knows every one of the things you struggle with or worry about. He has been there every step of the way. And what's more, he is going to give you eternal life. Remember, he's not only the shepherd, right? He's the lamb who laid down his life for you. Isn't that comforting to know that? That there will be one day that we can take off our Christian armor. We can lay down our weapons and stop fighting the battle of Christian faith. Because we'll be up there with that, with that crowd in white robes in heaven singing around the Lamb. So do you hear the voice of the shepherd? He makes a unique sound. Your good shepherd does. It's the sound that you hear and read in the Bible. Those of you who've been through a BIC class with me will be familiar with the saying, keep the book open. You probably get tired of hearing me say, keep the book open. Keeping the book open means keep the Bible opening. Open so you can hear your shepherd's voice. And what does he tell you if you keep the book open? He says that you'll never perish. No one can snatch you from his hand. How comforting is that? Do you ever worry about being saved? Do you ever worry whether you'll stay in the faith your whole life through? Do you ever worry that when you get to your last breath, you'll be in heaven? If you keep listening to your good shepherd's voice every week in worship, if you set aside time, the week, each day to listen to your Savior's voice, he says, no, you can't fall from the faith. Why? Because when you open God's word and listen to your Savior's voice, God goes to work with his miraculous power in you, pressing your first faith in your heart, keeping it there, not letting anybody take it away. So, as you go through life, which voice are going to follow? the voice of your co-workers, friends, the voices Satan likes to try to put in our heads, are we going to listen to the voice of our Good Shepherd? Past weeks we've been studying conflict in Bible study. 
And the first phase of conflict deals with having selfish agendas. That starts conflicts. So we had a question that said, what's the difference between a selfish agenda and an agenda? Well, that got talking about what's the difference between a goal and agenda. And that got us talking about plans. And so often in life, I think we, Jesus sheep, we want to go through life planning everything. How much I'm going to make, what kind of job I'm going to have, um, getting married, having kids, doing this, doing that. And then when those plans don't happen, we get so disappointed. I wonder if a better way to go through life as Jesus' sheep is not being so concerned about plans. Oh, make them, that's fine. But shouldn't we just be concerned about one thing? That we're following Jesus' path? Isn't that he meant what he meant when he said, if my sheep hear my voice, they'll follow me? So we follow Jesus. That means we put God and his word first in our lives. That means we do all things for his glory. We serve God, we serve our neighbor and love them. And if we are staying on that path, then it doesn't really matter what job you end up having, does it? Or how much money you make? Or what kind of house you're living in? Or what relationships you have or don't have or what you do, right? That path is the right path because where does it lead? It ends up leading to eternal life, doesn't it? Amen.